I think after series two, I expected there to be a third series. Um, I think after series one, that was the big wait, you know, in anticipation. We knew that a lot of things had to change, you know. Very unhappy with the sets. Um, with the sort of painting of the sets and things like that. I mean, everything was like ocean grey or military grey. <laughs> <laughs> My memory of series one and two is all very much black and white, because it was, it was kind of, it was very little colour, you know, even though I was wearing Hawaiian shirts, they'd been distressed to such a level that it was just sort of grey. Yeah, we wanted to, to, to give it a different look, uh, and we were in a, a different position. Uh, we weren't so much bystanders. Uh, we were aware uh, of some of the directions that had been given for the sets on the first series, which was Ed wanted it to be a grey submarine look. Um, and that sounded fine, you know, from being on the outside, but then it wasn't really a grey submarine look, it was a grey kind of wooden TV set look. Series three, in all areas, it, sort of, it, was, a, it was a sort of big lift, you know, um, in, all, in all departments, really. Yeah. Mel wasn't available uh, for those early series, and then he became available for series three. So Rob and I were very enthusiastic for getting him on board, and we had a long talk with him at the beginning and we talked about our influences being alien, and he t took that on board, uh, and seemed to have a plan where, with no money, he could give us a look that was incredibly more on screen than anything we'd had so far. You used to look around the set when we first got into it and went, that's a bread delivery box. That's what you'd realise. It was actually, you know, the things when they deliver bread from the supermarket, the big plastic tray, and you go, but that's, you know, and it looks like the grid at the side of a high-tech spaceship that's pressed out of titanium that's been mined on the planet. For <laughs> fur. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it was. It was bits of wood with holes in with light through, uh, as opposed to just bits of wood with no holes in. Um, and it was a, there was a kind of genius to, to what he was doing with, with no money. I think Mel produced a, a working set for us that really took Red Dwarf into its next sort of step. So it started to become, have more of a space age feel about it, I suppose. Well, this thing, the whole thing, it just looked glossier, you know? I think every series of Red Dwarf has its own identifying features, but I think it all started with a big kick on series three. You know? I mean, a lot of people are very nostalgic and uh, sort of misty-eyed about, oh, the first couple of series of Red Dwarf, they were my favourites, you know, when you could see this, you know. It was never supposed to be like that. It wasn't supposed to be like prisoner in cell block H in space, do you know what I mean? It wasn't supposed to be bang a door and see the set move. It had a sort of a solidity in, in its look, which was really advanced us forward. I think a great deal. Rob and Doug came in as producers and it was a more relaxed feel because they were, they, they'd started out as one of the lads, you know. Although it did quickly become a them and us scenario with Rob and Doug as well, you know. But um, it, was, it was a lot easier to, to deal with uh, than, than, um, than the way, than Paul's style of, um, of producing. No, they I'm, I'm trying my best to be very diplomatic. That was very good. <laughs> no. They knew right from day one, beginning before series one was ever shot, exactly what they wanted to see. But obviously they're writing it and, you know, they have to go through the mechanics of the television world and sort of various departments have to do their thing. But I think once they got control, they could really fine tune the whole look of the programme, the whole feel of it. And uh, I think that's what you saw um, in series three. I can understand people wanting to, um, you know, have their own, you know, ideas and views of how their work should be done. So. I'm one of the sort of pro do-it-yourself guys anyway. Uh, so I wasn't really bothered because, you know, I mean, my confidence in them was already high. You know, they'd, they'd broken enough ground. And Paul Jackson's uh, role was slowly becoming less and less and less, which was no bad thing, really, because uh, so Paul would just come in and shout at us most of the time, do you know what I mean, and try and scare us into, like, um, being funny. You can't really work in that, with that sort of pressure sometimes. I'm not saying that we didn't need it sometimes, because we were all like, we were all very young men, and we were all 
just getting f becoming very famous and moderately wealthy, and um, and we weren't handling it the best a lot of the time. You know, we were going out and buying things that we shouldn't buy, and sort of uh, we were very late. We had terrible problems with timekeeping, and Paul was psychotically anal about people being late. He hated you being late. Now there is the other side um, that isn't really maybe stated enough is that, you know, Craig and Dan were young and pretty tough to handle and discipline and punctuality and all the things that, you know, you kind of need uh, to make anything kind of work. Um, they weren't completely, you know, full on great at that. Um, and they did need a bit of, you know, someone uh, saying you need to arrive on time. I mean, it didn't need to be, you know, the kind of Alex Ferguson hair dry treatment, which they caught frequently. Um, but, you know, in the end, I mean, Craig certainly is never late now. He's always punctual. In fact, with Danny, I think we should bring Paul back and get him to have a word with him again. <gasps> Miss Jane! The character had been... Um auditioned, as it were, in an episode um, by another actor. So that character was something we thought would really work well. To work as a runner, it was then finding the right person to do it. I think the way I got the part of Crichton was from uh, being in a play at the Edinburgh Festival in 1988 called Mammon Robot Born of Woman, which had absolutely nothing to do with Crichton. Although there were some seeds, I can now see, of, of uh, a sort of Crichton-esque uh, behaviour in that play, and uh, which is a play I, I wrote, it was just a two-hander uh, play which was very successful, and Paul Jackson, who was then the producer of Red Dwarf, saw that play, and you know, he came up to me after I had worked with him before, and he said, oh, it's very good, Robert, lovely, and, and then disappeared, never had, didn't sort of think anything of it, and then, about, it must have been about six or seven months later, um, he rang up and said, do you want to come in and talk to these guys that do Red Dwarf? Well, I mean, to be honest, I really thought that, you know, after seeing David Ross play Crichton, and then, you know, we were told this other bloke was coming in to do Crichton, it was like, poor guy, you know, this guy's going to die a death, you know. I did ask, and the, and the irony of that's so cruel, I did actually ask if I'd be recognised, be recognisable as the robot, because I, I was worried about that, because I was also working on another project about robots, and I didn't want to be, and this is the actual quote, typecast as a robot. <laughs> it was just, those words came back to haunt me many times. And, they, and uh, Rob Grant, in his inimitable way, said, don't worry, Bobby, no one will recognise you. But if people see my face, what are they going to think? Tell them you had an accident. <laughs> Tell them you took your car to the crushers and forgot to get out. <laughs> yeah, because of his comic timing and his malleability and his expressiveness, it was really, you know, no contest. He was fantastic. And I just thought that at that stage I'd be wearing a kind of Robocop helmet. You know, you would sort of be a thing over there and, you know, maybe some funny costumes with lights on. And then you know, at lunchtime I'd take the helmet off and go and have lunch with everybody else. I had no idea <laughs> what I was being let in for. So uh, that was basically how it started. And I think I did, I did do some, some peculiar walks for them at that stage, which was only slightly embarrassing in that one of them I called my Douglas Bader special, which was, a, which, as I said, you could walk like a mechanical walking machine that had, had limited um, joints. And so I walked with kind of stiff knees. You have to kind of use your hips to walk, which was fine. And they laughed and they thought that was funny. And then at that time, I'd never met Doug before. Um, who has a one false leg, as I'm sure many people know, and I sort of did my silly walk, and I was even doing squeaky sounds uh, as I did it. <laughs> and, and then at the end, they all got up and shook my hand, and Doug walked over to me, and I thought, is he, he's not taking them, <laughs> is he? That's, you know, and I thought, well, that's... And I, I remember walking out there going, what a shame, because that would have been really good fun to do that job, but I've totally blown it. Stopping distances. You're travelling half the speed of light. What is the stopping distance? Uh, four years, three months. <laughs> and the thinking time? A fortnight. <laughs> And Robert gave us the idea, I um, gave us the chance uh, to have like exposition on legs in a way. Because that's where Norman, you, Norman's part really was to set up the plot. Uh, give him a couple of gags, set up the plot, everyone goes, oh, wow. Um, and, and Crichton could do that, uh, but he, he had legs and he could come onto planets with us and, and, you know, he could interact with us far better. I mean, it was instantaneous kind of acceptance. It was very rapid. And they, I mean, the cast are such a laugh, <laughs> that you kind of got sucked into it very... I don't really remember kind of an awkward morning where I didn't feel part of it. It was really quick. It was very quick absorption into that group. We could talk at length about Robert as a 
a chap in terms of you know the whole Crichton character, but I don't think there's many people who could play Cat Crichton. I mean, in retrospect, yes, it's easy to say that now. I mean, because he's made the part so much his own. But I mean, boy, oh boy, I've never met a man with so much patience, you know. I tried all these different walks when we were first talking about it in the rehearsal studio without the costume on. Um, all sorts of silly walks. And actually, what, was, what defined the walk was, was the costume. I mean, it was quite restrictive because your shoulders were held really rigid and your legs were held rigid. You eventually just... I'm the only way I'm bloody walkers like that. I just thought I'd give your quarters a quick tickle around, sir. I won't take a jiff. Was they didn't want Crichton to sound like C-3PO or Marvin the Paranoid Android from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It was kind of English butler, you know, in, in whatever sense of voice, which I could have done sort of, well, Mr. Lister, so, you know, you could, it would have worked in a sense. And then we try, did try, we, I remember trying to read it in with a French accent, and that was very rapidly rejected, a Swedish one, which lasted quite a long time, so which was sort of, I think I'd done a kind of comedy character on stage, who spoke a little like this and had the Ching Song boys. And, you know, that was, hello, my name is Craig, and, you know, it was quite fun. And then Craig started hitting me, and he said that would drive everybody mad. You know, it was kind of, it, 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 would, very, it would be very hard to sustain it. It was like, a, you know, in one line it got a laugh, but to keep it going all the time. They must have gone through every accent in the world in rehearsal with Doug and Rob, you know. And, you know, how many more, you know, there's 75 silly walks you can do, you know, and they must have covered them all, you know. And Robert, at the end of it, was still patient. About three hours before, I would have stormed through a window and gone and left the planet, probably, you know. But, you know, Rob was, Robert was sitting there sort of going, uh, right, guys, so, uh, so let's go back to 35. Voice 35, walk 100. Um, is that a good combination? Let's try it again anyway. Let's try it for the 73rd time. And at that time, I'd spent quite a lot of time in Vancouver, in, in uh, British Columbia, in Canada, and I, I found that accent really intriguing, which, it, I mean, my crude an analysis is it's quite strongly influenced by a Scottish accent, but it's Ameri kind of American Scottish, because they do say words like hoose. Let's go out of the hoose, or they say out of the hoose. But with connect, so, and I, so originally it was meant to be like that, but as many uh, British Columbians have pointed out, quite vociferous to me in, in the following years, I don't have anything that resembles a, a Vancouver accent, but that was where my, it was my idea of it. I've lived a long and relatively interesting life. The only truly terrible thing is that, as my adopted owner, you have to die with me. <laughs> <laughs> you what? Joke. Deadpan mode. He added yet another type of energy that, that you know, helped Craig, myself and, and Danny uh, and, and Hattie along. I mean, I think they must have explained to me, but if you've never had it done, you don't really know. So they said, you know, we're going to cover your head in plaster of Paris and you've got to sit very still, but you can breathe through a straw stuffed up your nose, you know. So you go, oh, yeah, fair enough, carry on. Until they go, you know, on your face. And it is kind of, uh, it's an unusual experience. I wanted to get uh, a lot of angular features on the face, um, keeping it flesh-toned and, and flesh-looking. I thought they were making a mould so that they could then make the helmet. <laughs> I was still sure it was going to be a helmet that would fit really well. It would be a really high-tech thing with lights and buzzy things on it. And then, uh, then I went in and they showed me this sort of square rubber head. And they did talk about that, you know, that we could do a line here and lines there. And, you know, they were kind of looking at my face and working out how to do it and drawing on the mould, uh, you know, on the actual cast of my head. And I was very interested in what they were talking about. But then when you actually, s I first saw the rubber, the rubber mask, I went, I see. <laughs> it does go all over. <laughs> We'd already had Hattie playing a female Holly before in an earlier episode in an earlier series. So she seemed a natural choice. <laughs> I got a call from my agent saying that they were auditioning for a new Holly because Norman wasn't doing series three. So I thought, oh, what? you know, oh, it's exciting. Well, Hattie was a lot less of a shock, really, because she'd played Hilly. And so we'd actually seen her, you know, be Norman or the female version. They gave me a bit of the script to read. There was Ed, Rob and Doug there, and they said, uh, can you read this? So I like read it, and then they said, no, out loud. <laughs> What's the time period? Well, it's difficult to pin it down exactly, but according to all the available data, I would estimate it's round about lunchtime, maybe half one. <laughs> I think they auditioned about, well, about 10 people that day, I think because uh, I can read upside down, so I was reading down their list. And some people were quite, you know, quite proper, well, I'd say proper actors, whereas I'd just done stand-up. Once Crichton came, the part of Holly really changed. I thought Norman's Holly was 
was you know really funny. Had some great lines. He had some great big scenes. But Crichton took over that role. So the, the Hattie's role as Holly was much more reduced and a, and a lot less funny. She had a lot. She had a lot less to do really because Crichton was doing all the exposition. It was actually good to have a female voice on the show, you know? Um, sounds odd to say that, but uh, it really actually just uh, tempered a little bit of the, the sort of male domination. They weren't black holes. What were they? Grit. <laughs> <laughs> Five specks of grit on the scanner scope. Yeah, the first episode we filmed for Red Dwarf 3 the night before, I was still at the Edinburgh Festival. There was a party, and I thought, oh, should I go to that one? I went back to the flat, and I thought, no, I'll just nip to the party for an hour or so. It won't make a lot of difference. <laughs> so I got all dressed up in my blue 50s cocktail dress and high heels and everything. And, uh, and I went along to this last night party, and, uh, and the person I was sharing a flat with was there and everything. And then all of a sudden, he wasn't there, and so I didn't say goodbye to him. So then I went back to the flat and realised I hadn't got my front door keys and uh, I just sat on the doorstep all night until the taxi arrived at six in the morning because I couldn't get in. And uh, he said, have you got any luggage? And I went, yeah, but it's all in the flat. <laughs> so um, I turned up, well, came to Heathrow, I uh, got a cab to Acton and uh, turned up in the rehearsal room with me 50s cocktail dress, lovely blue and black cocktail dress, high heels and uh, makeup smeared all over the shop. <laughs> and, uh, and they just like went, <laughs> they, they really thought I was completely mad. So sort of Hattie and I were like the two new children at school, a bit nervous. We also got Howard in and Howard gave a Again, a kind of uh, a more, I think, realistic kind of textured feel to the clothes and the costumes. Howard started using a lot of sort of heavier fabrics, uh, sort of real fabrics like suede and leather, as opposed to cotton and nylon and all that kind of stuff. Hang on, wait a minute, nod, 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 nod. In the book, you know, think about the art school um, background, I took the fact that he would do, you know, he'd customise his own jacket. You're so smart. I'm glad I came with you. Well, we are the smart party. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here looking for trouble. I just came to do the Red Dwarf shop. He's smart. <laughs> He's smart. Just sat on a list of so much better than, um, than Hawaiian shirts and nylon boots, you know. <laughs> Captain Emerald. Um, he looked like I thought it was good, though, although everyone, he hated it. But um, it looked like something out of Captain Scarlet, you know what I mean? Um, uh... <laughs> Essentially, he was to have that sort of the hologrammatic look. It was to help show that he was a hologram. We used fabric that was two-tone, that had a different shine. The H became more sophisticated on his head. The good thing about Howard coming in was, you know, that person now wants to say, right, I want to make my mark on it. And the only way to make your mark on the cat is to go one step further. Yeah, we've been everywhere. 14 moons, two planets. I've been so worried, I haven't buffed my shoes for two days. The best thing about Cat was trying to get the, the cat movements. In the first two series, there was a lot of where he'd go up on his haunches and it'd be um, So we wanted a lot of swagger and a lot of attitude with him. Well, if you put it like that, I guess you're right. Damn my vanity. <laughs> Obviously, it was, the, it was the first time that Crichton was, was coming into the main character. Now, we, he'd been established in a, a previous episode, a previous series, uh, when he was a butler. Um, but obviously, he was this mechanoid um, character. So I took the metal element. Myself? <laughs> well, that's a bit of a barmy notion, if you don't mind my saying so, sir. <laughs> the, the idea being that if you peeled off his, his suit, he would look exactly the same underneath like an action man. Hey, if you can't stand the heat, vacate the cooking area, in or out. OK, I'm in. At that stage, I think it had a very rigid groinal section, <laughs> so I couldn't sit down without being unbolted <laughs> for a while. Because, <laughs> yes, as Craig pointed out, it was my big fat bum that always broke it, but I, had, I think it had Velcro originally down the sides, and then I only had to move slightly, it would go <laughs> It would just fall apart. So then it actually had <laughs> it had sort of bolts to hold it all together. The first series, we all flew. Uh, but people tended to miss planes on quite a regular basis, um, mentioning no names at all. 
But week three, when Craig had missed it every single week, you know, it was, it, it was decided that um, our pre-record days were getting shorter and shorter and we would all go up on the bus the day before. I know Craig was delayed one flight because he had bullets in his hat and uh, they wouldn't let him through. Um, and they were constantly being late. And then it was like, OK, you're not old or mature enough to get planes on your own. We're going to escort you to a bus and drive you up. It was like, you know, the sort of Sunday afternoon coach ride to the football match with, you know, crates of beer and um, videos to take us on. So, but we always used to watch like science fiction ones. Oh, marvellous it was. Oh, what an, what an exotic trip. We used to fly up there before and uh, it was quite weird actually. The more popular the series got, the worse our transport got. I didn't quite understand that. And we'd arrive there horrendously late. We'd do a, a camera rehearsal, get in the bus, drive up to Manchester. So we'd get out into the hotel at kind of one in the morning. And I'd go to bed and Craig and Dan would go out clubbing. You know? <laughs> well, we did the whole of Series 3 with a hangover, basically. I mean, um, um, this, especially the Friday um, was just all in the blur, really. Um, because we'd go out, you know, and we'd, you know, we'd, 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 Danny John Jules would be taking me to places like Moss Side, to all these, like, Shabines, and we'd be taking Norman Lovett with us in Series 2. Um, so by Series 3, we were like, well established on the, on the hassle end of Manchester scene, man, you know. We'd bonded more, I, I would imagine, uh, during the, the evenings out in Manchester. We had a good laugh, and it's a, it's a great city up there to, to go out for the night. And uh, we were in our 20s, and... Um, we, um, you know, we did what people in their twenties would do in a city like Manchester on a, after a hard day's filming. It's party time! <laughs> Don't forget that the Hacienda was open then, so because um, it was a long time ago. So and it was just down the road. So very often I've. I had been known to go to the Hacienda to find out if the boys were still there. So we'd be getting in at five in the morning, thinking we've got five hours before our ten o'clock call. And Robert going to work at five uh, to get into the match so that when we arrived at ten o'clock he was ready. So um, we kind of felt very sorry for him. Poor Robert though, you know, in those days it used to take three or four hours to put his makeup on. So he'd have to, you know, get up at crack of dawn, five o'clock in the morning out, and we'd be sort of coming in. Dun, 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 dun. We used to sleep through rehearsals the next day. Uh, we'd be blocking it on camera, and we'd, you know, people. Would, OK, Craig, you go over there. And go, All right. Um, in a daze, you know. But by the time we, the live audience came in the day after, we were all, you know, because we, yeah, we were all there. We'd, we'd rehearsed it all week, so that first night in Manchester was a good way of letting your hair down. It was great for sort of team spirit as well. When we'd finished the shoot on, a, on you know, whatever it was, Friday night, we'd, get, we'd all get back in the bus after the, the recording, which was, and it was always me last. It took so long to get the makeup off. So that the whole bus would be waiting outside the studio from, from, from everybody inside already. <laughs> like that. And I'd get on with my bags, going, oh, everybody, eyes held open with tape, you know, trying to keep going. And then the mad drive back where you would hear classic showbiz anecdotes from Danny or, <laughs> or motoring facts from Chris Barry. You could get some great ones of those. Uh, Acton was where most of the BBC shows used to rehearse. I mean, it was a series of floors with kind of like a gym floor and uh, baseball nets which were used as kind of to work out where doors were and on white tape and chairs and they were very dull, very boring. I hated Acton. It was hell to get to and I didn't think it gave the actors any sense of uh, where they were or what they were doing. I always remember them having, there'd just be all these different things that should have been props that actually weren't, it was just anything that was there, because they didn't have the real props to mess around with, because they were up in Manchester, and we did the rehearsals down in Acton, so it'd be like picking up a banana and going, you know, death to you type thing, and <laughs> they're going, sorry, is the banana, is that a ray gun or is that my hat? You know, and just like, everyone would lose track of what all these props were. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in the lift with people like Ronnie Corbett and things like that. You know, they'd be rehearsing the two Ronnies while we're rehearsing Red Dwarf on another floor and all that. I remember once, after a heavy, heavy night, I remember, this is a true story, after a really heavy night, I'm in the lift with Robert, with Robert and, um, and um, I farted. 
which was, uh, you know, it wasn't very nice because we'd been, we'd been, we'd been very, 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 very drunk the night before. And I, I let one go, and I looked around, and, and Ronnie Corbett was standing behind me. Now, Ronnie Corbett genuinely is tiny, you know. And he, he, he was about, he's about exhaust pipe height, if you know what I mean. And he got the full front of it. And he got out on floor two. So we thought, oh, didn't think of it. But then we found out that he was rehearsed on floor five. <laughs> so, it, so it was so bad. He got out on floor two and walked up the stairs. <laughs> but I was so embarrassed. Ronnie Corbett, I mean, we were young and he was a comedy god. You know, the two Ronnies were like, wow. I had a medical appointment uh, and I took a, a brief history of time with me to try and attempt to read and I was determined, I knew I'd have to be, I was going to be waiting ages and so uh, I thought I'm going to read this, speed read this for an hour and a half and see if I understand any of it. I mean obviously the, uh, the mathematics were, I understood those completely, uh, but there was a couple of things that really stuck in my mind and one was uh, this uh, Hawking's theory that it was perfectly uh, possible for the universe to go forwards and then hit the big crunch and then time rewinds and goes backwards, back to the Big Bang. It was devastatingly difficult. Because, I mean, you just got sucked into the discussion, you know. Wait a minute, Lister's got the black eye now. It's getting slowly worse as he comes up to the point where the man unpunches him. Wait a minute, no, but he's still got the tooth. Oh, is he? Oh, no, he's got to have the tooth sucked back in. He's going to have his tooth knocked back in before he goes through the... Or does that go happen after he goes through the window? And it was... Because we, although we, you, know, you don't shoot those things in sequence, we had to have all that kind of makeup and stuff the right way around. Otherwise, we'd sort of do the tooth and then, uh, oh, my God, he's still got the black eye, but not the tooth. You know, it just took hours and a lot of stressed directors walking around, scratching their heads. In those days, there was about... I think there was two videotape machines at the BBC that would run backwards. So... Um, it was really, really difficult to try and to try and visualise any of this stuff because you could only get a certain time to work on those machines. I mean, now it's a piece of cake. But then, the only way really that I could tell if anything was worked backwards was to go out and film on my DV. It wasn't a DV then; it was something like a Hi8 or something like that. <clears throat> shoot on a location, go back, and then press the rewind button to see how it worked. There was a thought of where do we stop thinking about going backwards here, you know, uh, you know, because if we start analyse it too heavily, then, you know, we, we, we'll, we just won't know when to stop. So let's just stop analysing it now and just do it and go for it, you know? Yes, I think people were un breaking down, getting tearful, not understanding what happened. So actually preparing for it was quite hard, but shooting for it was really hard, because as a director you have a certain geography in your mind. So if you have a, a shot and for argument's sake, it starts wide and finishes tight, then logically your next shot should start wide so that the two will cut together. Then this shot, which is going to that shot, now that one's backwards. So that one now starts wide and finishes tight, but because you're running it backwards, it's, it's been shot the other way, but it's got to join onto this shot, which has been run forwards, and so, you know, you start to, your brain starts to explode. <laughs> There's a perfectly rational explanation for all this. Phil, it's not if you know, it's near enough now. They were running a tandem and it was running backwards. So there was two shots. That's a good example. There's a shot where they came around the corner from left to right. But then when you run the thing backwards, it went from right to left. And then the next shot was them forwards cycling, but being pushed backwards so that their dialogue was forwards, but they were riding backwards. And getting the geography of that, I, I did actually screw that up and I had to flip the shot to make it work. Stop! Stop! There's always holes like that, you know, when you come to rehearsals, you start thinking, it's a, I mean, you've got the great, you know, premise and all that, and you think, ah, well, if the, that can't happen, because if that happened, that would happen, and, you know, so there's always, we're always working our way through a, 
a minefield of um, sort of sort of continuity sort of potholes that it's so easy to fall down if you take it. And we've, you know, any Red Dwarf fan will tell you, we've fallen down them thousands of times. So, oh, yeah, you, know, you can get a little keyboard with a sampler on and, you know, sample it and play it backwards to find out how exactly those words sounded backwards. And the thing about backwards was when, when you heard words backwards, they didn't sound anything like you think they're going to sound. Some of the stuff that we found out in backwards, you know, you think bitter backwards would be written or something like that, or written, but it's not, it's air skip. But, you know, if I say air skip and you turn that backwards, that'll say bitter. That's quite weird. I've messed up with you, I just I've met, and I feel... Yo, matey, what's that you're drinking there? You know, drinking beer skip. Erskip. Ah, Erskip. Two pints of Erskip, please. Erskip? Two. Was that difficult? No. Mm -hmm. With a smart party. We were filmers on the docks. And, like, Toxtuff just, like, the other end, you know, just... just city centre, uh, Toxtuff, uh, the docks, so it's just across the city. So, um... So I used to nip out whenever I could. You, there's always a distraction when you're on location, because uh, either where you're filming or, you know, there's... Uh, if you've got, like, especially outside, you've got much more time on your hands because it takes longer to set things up. So, you know, you can, you can stray. We went to lunch, um, and because of there being so many vehicles and whatever, we hung all the car keys in the back of the prop van. So all the car keys were there for everybody. Um, and then we came back from lunch, and everybody's ready. Now, you've got to imagine it isn't single camera we're shooting here. We've got five prop guys, we've got standby chippies, we've got painters, we've got half a ship built, we've got set up for them appearing out of this ship that doesn't exist um, because it's invisible. So we've, we're setting up and we're trying to push along and I think we got slightly behind um, and then it was discovered that Craig and Danny weren't there. I'm easily led. Mike Agnew was always very good at having kittens. <laughs> I mean, this is only, remember, you know, thinking about it now, we kind of think that they might have borrowed one of the cars and disappeared for a while. It was lunchtime and there was kind of a few hire cars lying around. <laughs> so we're in Liverpool and uh, Craig thought maybe we could just do a little tourist jaunt. But this is now getting on to a half an hour, 40 minutes after we should have started shooting. And, um, and they appeared uh, from nowhere. And I went absolutely ballistic. I just went nuts because as a production manager on a BBC show at the time, of course, you were the production manager, the location manager, the unit manager, the first assistant, the, uh, the floor manager in studio. You did all the jobs and it was expected. That's what you did. And, and I, you know, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Now everybody split up and you have lots of different people doing those jobs and um, it's not quite the same. But uh, then you're doing everything. So you tend to get a bit wind up, wound up about stuff, especially when your director is going mad about the schedule. Well, that was his job, to have kittens and to worry about us. So we, gave, we made sure he did his job well. <laughs> and so uh, I saw Craig and, um, in no uncertain terms, asked him where he had been um, quite loudly and actually running quite fast at him. Um, and he, uh, he asked me, he just said to me, what's your problem, Agnew? And I, I think... The words I used were, you're my something problem, Craig. Um, at which point he got quite defensive and I got quite aggressive. And it was at that point that Ed appeared out of the truck and stopped me from actually hitting him. Um, then there were lots of apologies and whatever. Uh, and Craig and I uh, get on very well now. But uh, at the time, yes, we had a bit of a moment there. Yeah, I wasn't actually there that day because there, there was a stand in Crichton in one of those scenes earlier on, because I, I can't remember what, I think I was working, that was at the kind of very beginning of the shooting, and I had some work that was overlapping, so I couldn't be there that day, so there was a, I don't know who that, wonder who that stand in Crichton was, because I've, I've never been to that lake, wherever they filmed that lake, and there is a shot of Crichton in a speedboat, I was really jealous, because I'd never been in one of those at the time. It was kind of quite dangerous as well, and it was freezing, I'm, I'm head to toe, heavy leather gear, and I've got to walk backwards slowly and submerge myself into the lake, but I couldn't really get myself under because, you know, you'd get air bubbles underneath your jacket and stuff like that. So I just stuck loads of lead weights and stuff like that in my pockets and down my boots and things like that. And then I walked backwards into the lake again and I managed to submerge myself. But there was about 12 inches of silt underneath this, um, you know, at the bottom of this lake. And it, it was kind of, my boots got stuck in it and I could hear them, you know, in the distance screaming, action, action, action. And I'm, I'm trying to sort of... Um, 
I'm trying to get my boots out of the, out, out of the silt so I can sort of start walking. I'm running out of breath and I'm thinking, oh God, I hope someone comes and rescues me really, really quickly. Uh, but in the end, I kind of managed to sort of um, get one foot out and just get, and manage to get a bit of air and then just kind of do the scene. there, but they're not. <sighs> You're dry. That's weird. But the big test with the actor is that they have to stay underwater long enough for the water to become flat. And in the end of the day, you're completely in their hands. You can't gonna go, I'll cue you. <laughs> they're underwater, you know. So, uh, and Craig was great. He hung around underwater for a really quite a long time, and the, the water was completely flat before he re-emerged. You know, I was in me green git rimmer outfit with the aerial sticking out of the peak cap, I think, and Robert was Crichton. And the extraordinary thing is, all of Manchester saw these two figures walking backwards, and it was as if nothing odd was happening. They just did not bat an eyelid. And the universe starts expanding. Eventually, when it's expanded as far as it can, there's the big crunch, right? And everything starts contracting. That was kind of like one of the biggest ever gags from the cat. <laughs> when I actually first read it, I actually had to ask them what happened. You know, like, what, what, what's going on here? And Doug sort of goes, it, it, it's, it's a backwards beep. Uh, I went, oh, right. So I understood fully, you know, what his reaction should have been. And, and I actually got them to sort of, everything was up, you know, my eyebrows was up. I got them to get the hair up. So everything was just like upwards. And then when he tries to walk, you know, it's still walking upwards rather than forwards. So that's how that funny walk came about. And Blue Midget, on screen to me, just didn't look like a particularly detailed miniature. It looked like something that had had to be made quite quickly. And also the set was very contained and small and you couldn't really do much on it. <laughs> we had a, a, a chat with uh, Peter Rag. He went off and I think at this point it was called White Midget the craft that we'd written in the script. And he came back with this bug-shaped thing. And uh, we went, oh, it looks like a bug. Like it hadn't occurred to Peter that it looked like a bug. He went, yeah, the guys are calling it Starbug. And we went, oh, that's a good name. Maybe it could be green. And he went, well, that's what I was thinking. And then it became green as opposed to white. And as is always the case, uh, things never end up as they were intended to originally. Anti-grav, check. Retro, check. Boosters, check. And very gently, ease forward. I did my warm-ups, actually, in, in, as, a, as a character called the Fabulous Tony, all-round entertainer, and I wore this ludicrous bright green suit. They just said, come and do your character in this show and wear your own suit. I think it was a, a cost-cutting thing, so that they knew I had a suit, therefore I'd be cheaper to hire. So, um, yeah, I just did uh, what I normally do. I could say anything I liked, because they were just going to spin it all backwards anyway. So that was my finest backwards performance I've ever given, actually. I was thrown through a plate glass window about four times, I think. Um, and I was quite heavy in them days, I was, you know, and the guys had such problems getting me through it. <laughs> they had to pick me up and, and launch me. I think it was probably more than one take. Craig's very game like that. If you chuck him through a window and you think it could be better, he'll do it again. He's very good. He was always good like that. I always had great admiration for him. He never, ever said, ooh, ooh, I'm in agony, I don't think I can do that again. He just got chucked through the window again. 
there was no difficulty in persuading Craig to have a go at things. I, I love doing all that bit. I mean, that's kind of... You know, I think stuntmen have the best fun of the, of the lot, you know. I mean, you do all the sort of close-ups and all that, and then you let the stuntman go and do all the exciting stuff. I like getting the explosions and all that kind of stuff. One rumble! <laughs> by five black holes. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it? We've been in deep space for three million years and there hasn't been one. Then all of a sudden, five of them turn up. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk about that one because I'm not in it that much. The genesis of that, the, the whole ice thing, was uh, a meeting with Rob and Doug and me and Peter Rag, the visual effects um, designer. Rather than us writing stuff and them trying to deliver what we had written, we wanted to reverse it a bit. And so we met with the VisFX guys and said, what can you do that would look really good? And that's where the snow thing came from, from Maroon. He said, we do good snow. I think Peter made the mistake of saying, I th snow is good, we can do snow. <laughs> and I said, obviously it's not snow, what do you actually, what's it actually made of? And he said, um, soap flakes. It looked very realistic. Um, unfortunately, everyone slid around for the next couple of days um, because we had a nice soapy floor. Of course, I've got to fall out of the uh, spaceship, land on, on the... Um on my back, then start trying to dig my way through and then just get completely blown into the side of this um, boulder. And they pulled me on this rope really hard. And I you bang your side, really hit me back as well. And then you, you kind of open your mouth and early soap. I tasted soaps for, soap for weeks, man. I mean, Craig suffered a lot that day as well because he, he had to climb out of a door and then do a comedy falling down because the wind's so strong fall. He didn't have to do any acting at all. He climbed out the door and the wind just took his feet away. It was very... I mean, they, they create like 70 or 80 mile an hour winds, those machines, and it's very hard to stand up near them, so... <laughs> Credit to Craig, we put him through hell on that and he just kept going, you know. He never gave up, never complained, always got on with it. That was so bloody painful. I mean, it was more painful for Robert Llewellyn. He had his eyes, um, his mask was on, but his eyes were glued open. They had to paint so much makeup to cover the join from the rubber mask to my eyes that they just kind of kept layering it on, which was you know, if you're sit, sitting like that, it's just having your eyeballs painted. It's not that terrible. You're not your, your eyelids, not your eyeballs. Luckily, they didn't paint my eyeballs. That would have been very bad. But what happened then, when I opened my eyes, my eyelids got basically stuck, so I was like that, so I couldn't really blink, you know. <laughs> Which is, you know, not pleasant, but it's not horrible, until someone actually blows soap flakes into your face from a huge fan. This is a, the engine of a Volkswagen with a propeller on it, with a kind of guard around it. It's a wind machine. So they start out, this thing and the wind starts to go, all right, everybody ready? Then they pour soap flakes into the wind so, and it creates an instant blizzard. Brilliant effect. But there's me going, ah, with foaming eyes. <laughs> a pint of lager just didn't taste the same that night. It was just like, you know, just, you were blowing bubbles. <laughs> Still snowing, is it? <laughs> I mean, you're head to toe in leather. You got a, you got a, you got a fire there. You got all the lights. You're, you're sweating your hairies off, and um, and you're supposed to be. I decided to shoot the entire show handheld. So uh, apart from some of the ice stuff, everything in the studio, everything in Starbuck was shot handheld. And uh, to my, to my knowledge, that was the first sitcom that had ever been shot handheld. That's it, there's nothing else. <laughs> Just a pot noodle. <laughs> oh, and I found a tin of dog food in the tool cupboard. Well, it's obvious what gets eaten last then, isn't it? Can't stand pot noodles. 
<laughs> and it's a very powerful story. It's a very good story that people could identify with because it was to do with, you know, you, you can understand being stuck in the middle of nowhere and you haven't got anything to eat. You're going to die. You know, it's a great, it's a great thrust to get that story going. And so all that claustrophobia really helped it and it really made it look great. I thought that was some of our best work in the early ones. Our finest hour, as it were. I think it's my second favourite, probably, of, of, of all Red Dwarfs, you know. Um, and just to do the, yeah, to, to, to read the dialogue for the first time was just one of those moments as an actor, you just sort of, uh, you know, great, I can't wait to, to do this. I used to play golf. I hate people who abuse the facilities. <laughs> I hope you rake the sand back nicely before you... <laughs> that would be a hell of a lie to get into, wouldn't it? Competition the next day, your ball lands in Lister's buttock crevice. <laughs> You'd need more than a niblick to get that one out. <laughs> I just want to say I've got a big bump. <laughs> big? It's like two badly parked Volkswagens. <laughs> I think Maroon is my favourite episode in terms of, you know, the way that those guys played it and the way that we experimented with a style of shooting. I loved Maroon. I just thought it was... I just think it, if ever we did a Red Dwarf stage play, I'd love to do Maroon, does it? Because it's just like... Basically, it's a two-hander, you know, and great dialogue, great stories. It was a long episode for those two, uh, you know, to be funny, sitting around a fire in a studio with an audience, with a fire going, uh, you know, Five handheld cameras, cameramen leaning over each other. My favourite shot from the whole sequence in, inside Starbug was Craig trying to eat a, had to eat a bit of dog food, and he got the spoon of the he got the the spoon out of the dog food on the end of it, and he was going to put it into his mouth. And as he did it, the camera moved in to Craig, <laughs> to the point where actually the end of the camera I think hit the end of his hand. <laughs> as you put it into his mouth. As a result, you get this great wide-angle, grotesque shot of somebody... You're following the dog food into his mouth. I'm sure the dog food will be lovely. <laughs> Remember, this isn't dog food. This is a piece of prime fillet steak and blue cheese sauce. It's been charcoal broiled in garlic butter and is going to taste delicious. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can see why dogs lick their testicles. <laughs> it's to take away the taste of the food. That wasn't really dog food. I've said it was and all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't really dog food. I, don't, I actually don't know what it was. But they had... It was horrible anyway. They had a tuna stuff all mixed on, and then they put, like, marabone jelly on the top, uh, which was, like, probably scraped from the side of a... Of a tin of spam or something like that, you know. This. And it was great because it was disgusting, it was slimy, it was all teethy, and it was funny, you know, and those, that's a difficult combo to get, but he always used to manage to do it somehow. The polymorph model, yes, uh, bane of my life. Um, it was created and operated using cable control, so it was um, what we refer to as animatronic. And then, of course, as a director, you go, that's great, now I'd like it to scuttle up and down the thing and to take off and fly, you know, and they'll go, well, well, you can't, we didn't make it to do that. And you go, oh, God, it must be able to scuttle around. Always asking too much. And, of course, you know, the great thing about people like Peter is you always give it a go. <laughs> At the end of the day, it worked, but um, it wasn't without its uh, sweating brows and, uh, and a few curses. Yeah, well, I used to swear a lot anyway. I like swearing, so, you know, it was nothing personal to the polymorph. <laughs> <laughs> I did that because it's one of the moves I can do. Uh, but I had that, I, I looked like, like I was in Cameo. Remember that band Cameo, Word Up? Because I had this big sort of jock strap outside me, leathers and all that, to protect uh, my, my sacred love spuds. Snake! 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 It was a big snake, so its head was kind of that size. And when it, and it yawned, she said, oh, don't worry, that's just yawns. It went... <laughs> and this enormous mouth opened and the little pointy tongue thing came out. And she sniffed me. With a, she was a bit confused by the rubber head. She was doing this. 
And I sort of, that, that head's, and you try and push a snake's head away, thinking, that's a bit close. And they don't move. And you go, and it just wants to stay there. And then it goes, you know, you get that look. <laughs> you get the squashed Crichton look. So she gives you a little squeeze, you knew it. And that, I mean, I think there is a kind of one second shot of Tina around my neck. I mean, it's so brief. And the hours I spent with Tina trying to kind of bond. <laughs> there were two women, one woman who looked after her and her friend were there with the snake in a box. And when I'm not in costume, you know, I've got to get as cool as I can. So I walked into the, the room they were in, in a pair of grey socks, uh, underpants and a rubber head, and they were much more frightened of me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, just because it's an armour-plated alien killing machine that, that salivates unspeakable slobber doesn't mean it's a bad person. Yeah, I just sort of, you know, picked up on, you know, many of these sort of Boris Minor driving peace people that we'd seen at Greenham and just sort of exaggerated it, brought in a bit of hippiness, you know, and uh, and off we went. The beard and the makeup were, you know, the, the glasses and everything. That sort of Rolf Harris look-alike. We then changed it when Chris came up with the peacenik as a character. I can't remember what the original character was in it. And then we just let him rip and wrote notes down of stuff he was saying. And it was like such a scary thing because it's like, oh my God, if you open this out, they'll be wanting to do this every week and there'll just be mayhem as everyone goes, ah, I'll just have my, my part this week. But it was really kind of quite contained and good. And so Chris just went blur and did loads of stuff. And then we wrote it down and then went away and reshaped and reworked some of the things he said and put it in the script. And I think that's one of the few real scenes, um, you know, where it's been out, been kind of thrown out to the floor, as it were. So that's quite interesting. One, I think one of the one of the best things we ever did, probably. Where have you been? Let's go. I was getting myself comfortable, man. <laughs> that was good because you know I got to wear my hair out. I didn't have to go through the. I didn't have to go through all the shampoo and set that day. I am so sorry, sir. Just forget it. Oh, how can I forget it, sir? I compared your mother to a foolish, aged, blabbery fish. I, I said she was a, a simple-minded, scaly old piscine. I, I intimated she was an ugly, lungless marine animal with galloping senility. A, a putrid, amphibious gill breather with, with, with less brains than a mollusk. Forget it. The blubbery fish. What an agonising thing. I, I definitely wore a, a, a sort of channel in the tiles on my kitchen floor trying to learn that speech. It, it was a groove, you know, if you, spilt, if you spilt any soup on the kitchen floor, it always rolled into that point. It was so, I don't know why it was, I think it's the lists. I think that Rob and Doug realised that, you know, if they really wanted to give me a bad time, give me a list which almost repeats itself, doesn't it? And it was a brilliant speech. It was such a funny speech. So they got, they wrote down, uh, you know, idiot boards, which they didn't want the audience to see. We were doing it in front of an audience. So they were all turned away from the audience. And we got into the scene and started doing it. And, then, and I hadn't even thought about it then. It was just like, next scene, oh, Chris, I go in with Chris. Give him the, I, knew the, I knew the first bit. And then I got to the, oh, I'm so sorry, I've called you. And there were, all the idiot boards were still turned round. And then there was a, a lovely man called Mike Agnew, who was the floor manager, crawling on his hands and knees between my legs. It's the only way he could get in there while we were doing the shot to try and turn them round. And in fact, what you see is me doing that speech without seeing it, because I couldn't see them. So I actually could do it. It was, an, it was a confidence thing, you know. I actually did know the damn thing. With digital tape now, what you can do is take three elements and take them away and slap them together in the edit. But in those days, um, because it was one inch tape and you couldn't, it, you kept dropping a generation every time you try to add another layer of pictures onto the tape. We had to try and do it in the gallery. So as we were shooting it, so um, inevitably you'd have a piece of tape. It's cool rollback and mix. It's very good. It worked really, really well. So I'd have the background piece of genius, which would be Mel's um, uh, piece of Mel's set. Then I'd have the next layer piece of genius, which was Peter Rags' monster. And then the next layer piece of genius was three actors, and they all were separate entities. Yeah, it did work. It did work, but it could only be done live. So you'd have to run the piece of tape, and the actors would have to watch what they're doing, and then up would come the monster, and then they would come and they, and it was all a question of coordinating timing. We did a lot of that. We got quite good at it in the end. <laughs> Didn't know you could do that. Oh yes, I can plug a number of add-ons into my groinal socket, allowing me to <laughs> allowing me to perform virtually any household task imaginable. The only place you could really put it, because if you put it anywhere else, it seemed even more rude. 
Um, but having it there um, just just seemed to just seemed to fit the bill. So you just like stick the Ed whisk attachments on the end, and you can like whip up a Spanish omelet. I certainly can, sir. But it's amazing how few people are prepared to eat them. <laughs> he actually has the components of an old old vacuum cleaner that I had at home. We took the hose attachment out and sprayed it up to match his jacket. And it was only, it was done in a live studio audience. And we'd, pre, we'd done a sort of rehearsal and the crew had really laughed and thought it was fantastic. And we thought, didn't think anything about it. I now think I remember it because I've remembered it so much, but it was an extraordinary event. At that stage in my career, if you can call it that, um, you know, I'd appeared on thousands of stages in comedy shows, and so I'd worked with live audiences who laugh a lot when it went well, who walked out when it didn't. Uh, you know, so I was used to that kind of atmosphere, and I, but I never remember having to stop doing something because we couldn't hear each other. I mean, you know, we were all of five feet apart, Craig and I, and I couldn't hear anything he was saying because the, the audience were in such a hysterical state. We were screaming our lines at each other, but the noise was so much that we couldn't actually hear what each other was saying. So it was just a case of just waiting for his lips to stop and then hoping that it was the, that was the right cue for me to say my bit. And, and he was doing exactly the same thing. But, I mean, it was a, a riotous reception. And by this time, the audience were laughing so much that I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear dialogue. I couldn't hear cameras. Cameras couldn't hear me. I mean, the, the nature of directing these things is that it's all communication. And... Um, the whole communication had broken down because the audience had gone so nuts. Something very, very... It's a little pain in the throat. What's wrong? Oh, the underpants are shrieking. The books are alive, man. I'm getting smaller. Oh, no. Help me, please. Please, I'm begging you. I mean, really, the characters are so good that uh, the audience would just know... They would know often a character's reaction because they just were into the characters so much and the characters were so well-rounded. And then the, Chris has to come in uh, behind me with, the, with his sort of punchline, which I had no idea if he'd come in. I couldn't see him, I couldn't hear it. I, I knew I'd have to ride the laugh, but it, it, it wasn't, I mean, I, or I, I certainly knew I'd have to wait a long time for the laugh to stop. Um, but of course, I waited long enough you know, I thought, hang on, uh, how many more minutes of this episode can I waste just looking at the, uh, the uh, you know, just waiting for the line to happen, you know? So I just, I just jumped in, really, even when the, the laugh was still at sort of fever pitch level. <laughs> Totally shocked. <laughs> they didn't even get the full um, edit. You know, that, that, that scene was cut down by about half to what the laugh really was, I think. Keep that safe, it's Lister's mind. It was impossible to do in front of an audience because, well, because <coughs> Chris's voice had to come out of Craig's mouth and Craig's mouth voice had to come out of Chris's, yeah. No Welshin. Of course not. <laughs> you get a guide track on one, and then the other, and then the next time they did it silent, I think, as I recall, so that we could get the background, all the movement, the foley. So, otherwise, that's a nightmare to create. I had to do a line, and then Craig would go, and I'd have to not only know what my response was, because I couldn't hear him, because he couldn't say it, because then Chris would dub his voice into that, you know. You can imagine a man who's only got the flimsiest grip of his lines. I think there was quite a long time spent in the studio that day. Just as well there wasn't an audience, they'd have all thrown themselves off the seating. <laughs> They'd always tell you, you know, leave the gap there, because you're, you're gonna get a laugh there. And you'd probably, where? Oh, oh, there, yeah. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> it looked very good. Because John Pumphrey was given an opportunity then to light it without having to worry about an audience being there. So if you, if you look at that series, you'll see that, that there's a lot of very clever and, and, more, and an interesting lighting in that particular episode. I sort of just did a straight impersonation of Craig and it was, it was fun to do, you know. Um, I don't think he sort of, well, he'll, he'll be the first to admit that he didn't do a, a, a sort of fully fledged impersonation of me, but I knew if I'd got the mouth, you know, his 
you know, sort of mouth movements as much as possible. I'm no impressionist whatsoever. And um, I'm not that good at voices either. So um, that was a really worrying week for me. It was a really, really hard work uh, for me that week. Just trying to keep up with Chris's level of uh, mimicry, really, you know. Chris's impression of Craig physically um, was really quite good, spot on, in fact. Um, and, but, uh, but when you came to revoicing, um, Craig's impression of Chris fitting into his mouth was perfect. So they both had different strengths. So you, I, I don't think you can say that one was better than the other. They were great in their own, individually for different reasons. It was difficult for Chris because I speak a lot quicker than Chris speaks. And um, so he's got to get his rimmer in, you know, be rimmer in a short space of time because I speak quicker. Whereas, um, but I, I, I was really good at sort of hitting um, uh, the, the marks in the, um, in, in the lip sync studio. So it actually does look like my voice is coming out of Chris when he's speaking, which is it. It's, it's confusing. And when you're watching it, you start getting confused because you start thinking that's, that's him when it's me, you know, and that's me when it's him. If you watch it sometimes, occasionally I'm, my voice goes, sort of almost impersonates him, you know, when I'm doing me, just once or twice, you know, I, probably I'm the only one who can hear that, but I mean, um, but it was funny. I thought it worked out very well. <sighs> Robert's f first day was absolute hell. We were in a sauna, which was a scene that wasn't used. We were in a sauna, the entire crew in t-shirts and shorts and Crichton in full rubber. <laughs> And I had, a, I had the electric lighting finger to light candles for Lister's bloated out dinner. And I was going to light the candles by just going and my finger would kind of, you know, the flame would come out of my finger. And so that was uh, the, the electronics from a little electric cigarette lighter that were fitted inside the glove and with, you know, the, the gas tube coming out there. It was beautifully done. Peter Ragg made it. And, it, and then the, gas, the actual cylinder of the gas was down my sleeve and there was electronics and he was behind me with the switch to switch it. And it was all marvellous and it worked. We tried it beforehand and it went, wow, the flame is really clever. As always, I tried it on myself first to be sure that it was safe and nothing could possibly go wrong. I don't know how he survived that. Yeah, that was hot, that room. I mean, you walked in there and you, even if you weren't doing anything, you were just sweating. On the day, I was sweating, sort of, I would think, four and a half gallons an hour. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. So I was very damp inside. And, and, and Peter said I had a, a cut on my finger. I'm not, I don't quite remember that. But certainly my hands were in a bit of a, were in a damp condition. So that the two bits of bare wire for this really micro low voltage lighter, because it's not a big voltage, it's a, you know, it's a little spark. Every time he switched the switch, I go, let me light the candle. And I get this huge electric shock, because <laughs> it was direct contact to wet skin. And I just, it just, it, everything just compounded to make life extremely unpleasant. Robert yelped and leapt five foot in the air and um, uh, called me a few names, most of it under his breath, I have to uh, say. And all this time, Craig was lying in a lovely jacuzzi, reading a women muscle magazine, smoking a cigar, having a whale of a time. He's going, what's the matter, Bobby? It's fine. <laughs> just floating there for hours. <laughs> well, there's all these technicians trying to get this, <laughs> this electronic <laughs> finger to work. <laughs> This is what I call training. Paul Jackson, the man who'd originally seen the play that I was in, who was there that day, and, he, and I sort of collapsed on a stairwell in the sauna going, I think I'm a bit hot. You know, I didn't, you don't even register it, you just, your brains cook. I, I didn't feel ill, I just sort of fell over. And he, and he was sort of looking at me going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bet you're glad I saw that play now. <laughs> it was such a confusion episode to film. And then when I went like that and got all the, um, into the mashed potato and poured the gravy over me head, <laughs> the mashed potato wasn't properly mashed, it was big hard lumps of it and all the lumps went up my nose and it was horrible. It was, oh, it was like a really uncomfortable episode to do that. It's, it's strange, people always think that the directors di direct the miniatures uh, and it's, it's, not tr it's mostly not true on film. Uh, and it certainly wasn't true on Red Dwarf, Heat Rag and his, and his guys would go off. Uh, and they would uh, shoot the sequence and then, you know, we would see rushes um, as they came off. But in terms of um, storyboarding or camera angles, they were pretty much left entirely to their own devices. Uh, and then, you know, would give us the shots. If you shoot at 120 frames a second, you're shooting at five times normal speed. 
so everything takes five times longer to happen so it adds weight with the small budget that we had we were being kind of insanely ambitious um, by kind of cram all this stuff in but there wasn't the time or the money really to do it stop saying everything's crypto fascist make me sound like i was a complete git <laughs> I'm not breaking up the band. Music is my life. My brother Emil played me as a young man in Time Slides, yeah. It's one of my best weeks, you know. He'd just done that film, The Fruit Machine, and um, with Robbie Coltrane, and um, so he'd done a bit of acting before. He was lovely, Craig's brother, really so. And he was in this sort of, yeah, completely glam rock. It was everything from sweet teenage rampage. He had platform boots and very tight trousers and this bomber jacket and wild afro hair and a collar that he could have taken off with. One of the first songs I ever wrote. It was called Om. I think he did really well in it, you know, because he had a much less lived-in voice and all that kind of stuff, so he did genuinely sort of uh, appear that it could be me as a, as a, as a younger person, you know, because the voice was younger and stuff like that, and he still had that sort of idealism in his eyes. <laughs> That's Frank! It's my brother's wedding! Basically, you create a wipe, and then you can take the inside of that picture out and replace it with another one. And that's how we set up the, the, uh, the bulk of the slides. <laughs> <laughs> the bit where he fell out of the photograph had been filmed at least a month more earlier than when he f fell on the ground. But not only that, it was written, Robin and Doug, you know, testing the barriers. It was written so that he said half a word the month earlier and the second half of the word later. So I think it was fan smegging tastic In smegging incredible And then once we kind of, you sold the idea, so you go, right, that works. Everyone understands the concept of walking in and out of a photograph. Then when, then you can allow the comedy to work really well. So Craig throws a snowball out of the picture. Danny catches it, throws it back, hits him in the face. Massive laugh. <laughs> we just made him like a sort of rock star. We made him as Lister would be if he had wads of cash. And it was the whole thing with his stretch limo and, you know, big cigar and, you know, just the whole uh, sort of rock and roll elements. But, the, you know, he did have a Wilma Flintstone T-shirt. <laughs> Ed had said to me, because I wanted to direct, um, he said, why don't you direct this scene? Psst, wake up. What is it? <laughs> and then I sit, sat down in the big chair in the centre of the console and um, everyone's there waiting on your every word. And in walked Ed By, Paul Jackson, Rob Grant, Doug Naylor. Now have you got all that? I think so. Then my camera script got changed. Almost entirely. I mean, out of all proportion. Um, uh, just by the odds, oh, why don't you do it like that? And why don't you do it like that? And whatever. And it wasn't until afterwards, um, sort of looking back at it, I went, that's not what I wanted to do at all. But actually, it was probably 300% better than anything I could have done. Your Crichton Series 3 mechanoid is now reaching the end of its useful service life. It can hardly have escaped your attention that he's slow, stupid, crudely designed and quite amazingly ugly. He needs replacing. Things would crop up during a, a rehearsal time or, you know, an idea would happen sort of pretty much overnight and I think this was one of them that suddenly we'd have this alternate Crichton. I knew um, Rob and Doug a bit through uh, two other guys and absolutely the kind of the comedy mafia that happens. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd known them before, but I, I, they sort of said, we'd like you to do this part. And I didn't even go, I didn't have a casting, which was, at that stage of my career was very, very unusual. In fact, at this stage of my career, it's very unusual. Crichton, you're not dead. You should be dismantled and ready to leave. The background and kind of the fringe and stuff, you tend to make things yourself. So I, I, I literally was sitting there the night before going, I have no idea why they've asked me to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I suddenly thought, what's the, what's the voice that's not like me? Because they can't want a Scottish 
big Jesse kind of robot. What would that? So I started talking like that, and I said, "Oh, that's okay. That that might work." So um, so I did that. The problem being that I could only really I can only really do that for about ten seconds at a time. So by the end of the read through, my vocal cords were lying in a bloody mess on the table. But they were terribly impressed. That was the great thing. They were they were cock a hoop about it, and they said, "No, this is a great voice." And and I said, yeah, "That's very kind." And ten times stronger. <laughs> We'd meet at the BBC for our tech rehearsal and I went to the costume store and literally grabbed a whole load of stuff, studied uh, gloves and there was a crash helmet, and there was this sort of, we had a sort of um, a gorilla breastplate. Um, there was a complete mishmash of anything and everything. Going into this room where, where Howard, more in optimism than anything else, had come up with this fantastic uh, uh, costume that, that was... It was it was just the the simplicity of the design and the kind of the 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 way that he'd done it. It was just it was it was like you know when you see those documentaries in Star Wars where they say we couldn't find an eye for C three PO but we found this air vent that somebody had thrown away and suddenly that was right. And it was so you sort of got the feeling that Howard was doing that on a daily basis. We went up to Manchester, and I think overnight I sort of literally put this thing together. And as Gordon came in, we we literally added more or less or whatever and came up with, with the Hudson, which worked fantastic well. It looked like very, very good metal, but it was actually made of very, very thin and, as it turned out, rather sharp plastic. So there was, it, we, we, there was, once I put it on, there was a range of movements I could do, which actually helped the character, I think, probably. <laughs> the character. My God, that's a hefty thing to say. Um, but um, because you couldn't really, you couldn't move in any way like a human being at all. He had great big platform Herman Munster boots, which made him about eight foot tall. Um, and it was just all those those elements, and it was literally creating on the spot. It was very very frightening, and it they gave him these massive big boots, the heels that high. He was like ginormous, and it. A very rude man. Dying time. First up, they gave me a shotgun in that. Have you noticed? I've got a shotgun. I've got an old-fashioned sort of like well, old-fashioned in red dwarf terms, sort of twentieth-century shotgun, um, which I've never used since, and I'd never used before. Where did it come from? Where did it go? I used to do quite a lot of science at school, so I said, I said, trust me, that will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of just wrote various, so I think, I may, I may be completely wrong about that. I'm sure I'm exaggerating my role in the whole creative process here. Ten times faster than any droid on the market. <laughs> <laughs> It was sort of early days of this stuff where basically, I, I, literally, what happened was the camera was locked off and I did the thing, I came to the end of it and everyone stood still and they just took the chicken and I put the other chicken back and, I, and did it and it was all fine. Very weird, but it was, um, no, but that was very good fun. And again, that gave me a lot of confidence because it was a pre-record day, people started laughing uh, when you were doing it and it just makes such a difference because it is, it is weird when you come in to do one one thing in, in something like this, it's sort of it's sort of the royal family of sitcoms. You know, you kind of doffing your cap to people, and if they laugh, you kind of think, well, that's okay. You're doing the right thing. Is that the way you want it? It's the way it is. Then you better leave an address with your body, so I can mail it to your head. In fact, there was there's two fantastic things about the makeup. A, I I wasn't Robert, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, it was very bizarre. The the cast were just so happy generally on a daily basis not being Robert, apart from Robert obviously because he was Robert um, and everyone else you just if ever you're feeling down you just looked across at the lunch table and you saw this man trying to eat without moving his face. It must have taken oh 20 minutes poor man he suffered <laughs> and a really butch costume he looked really butch with a bit of mascara and a, yeah and a beard. Robert was so bloody jealous I want that for next season. I want that. The amount of time I spent listening to Robert Llewellyn moaning about his mask and he had this tube down the back of his head for the sweat kind of duck. I mean, it was... Anyway, so that was very good. But also, they, they, they made me up to be very tanned and they completely hollowed my cheeks out. I kind of looked like um, Ian Glenn for the one and only time in my life I was ever going to look chiselled in film movie like. And it was extraordinary. I, I, I mean, it just... I saw stills and, and it, it, it worked. As soon as I moved, you could see it was makeup, unfortunately. But the stills were fantastic. Don't tell Robert. He'll want, that's what he'll want. <laughs> 
It's a computer chip. Oh, it's a 5517-stroke W13 Alpha Sim modem. Oh, it's the interface circuit with a built-in 599XRDP. Oh, how did you know? Intuition. <laughs> Originally, um, Holly didn't get anything for Crichton in Last Day. And I thought, oh, Hollywood, you know. Hollywood? Hey, Hollywood. My goodness, I do believe I'm drunk. <laughs> I, I suddenly feel the need to, to strut my funky stuff. <laughs> Sit down, it's the booze, you're not used to it. We were only acting, unfortunately. I did suggest that we should do it method-wise method and just all get completely wrecked and then do it. Somehow, BBC, insurance, all that kind of stuff, being pissed in the studio, they don't like it, you know. <laughs> I think they were, but I think they've had quite a lot of practice. And I mean, I'm not very good at it. I have been drunk in my life, but I'm very bad at it. I get, I'm a very cheap date, and I can get drunk on half a sort of lager shandy. And it's, in fact, quite a weak shandy. So, I mean, I was sort of doing quite bad drunk acting, which was very appropriate for Crichton, thank goodness. Not during the course. Definitely afterwards, but not during the course, as far as I know. I can just like, lie back and accept it. You know, there was an awful lot of moaning going on as well. Robert was, you know... And from Hattie as well. Hattie was moaning. Hattie wanted her an episode that featured, you know, heavily hair because she had a small cat. And um, Robert wanted an episode that featured him. And, um, and uh, it was easier to do one featuring Robert first uh, because he's such a, he was so he's so accomplished, you know. And by the time he got to last day, he was he was flying, you know. He just fit into the into the into the sort of network of characters really well. A lot of that's to do with the, the writing, obviously, but, um, ob but his, his level of performance and the way he interacted with the other characters just worked really, really well. So he had a kind of chemistry that you knew you could exploit. As Crichton is being written and as Robert's performing it, you can see Doug's eyes just opening wide and think, God, I've got a smash here, you know. This character's, you know, you, you could see it building all the time and it, you could see Crichton building all the time. It very quickly became one of the most popular characters, you know. I mean, I mean, you know, even overtaking me and Chris, uh, in, in, you know, in some people's estimations, you know, because it's, it's a fantastically thought out, excellently crafted and brilliantly acted character, you know. Don't give me the Star Trek crap, it's too early in the morning. Me and Crichton were both new for Series 3, um, well, as us, anyway. Uh, yeah, I always wondered about whether I was going to get death threats or something, but luckily I didn't. If I did, they were diverted, <laughs> which I don't know if that's worse, not to know about them, but uh, no, it seemed to be all right. I mean, by the time we, we recorded The Last Day, which was, was the last episode we recorded of Series 3, um, you know, I'd felt, uh, I'd really kind of got to know this little group of people. I mean, it wasn't, it, you know, very much centred on the cast, but also everybody else outside it, Rob and Doug, the writers, and Ed, the director, and all of, you know, Mel Bibby, uh, Peter Rag, all that crowd, you know, it is a very intense, enclosed little working environment. You get very close to them. And you have to, because it's kind of trench humour that goes on. You've got to get through this insane job. Everybody's got, you know, if you haven't got a rubber head on, you've got weird teeth in, a funny H, or your head's sewn up with that, or you're sitting with a neck brace, you can't move, you know. I mean, we all had our bit to carry. We always expected never to come back, I think. I was kind of depressed because I thought, what, what a brilliant job. I really enjoyed doing it. And it's the last one we'll ever do, because it was at that time the end of the series. We've done three series, we never expected to do any more. Big party that night for all the people who've been in it. Every last episode made you paranoid. <laughs> you think, is this the last one? I don't think I felt that, because, I mean, I thought this show has a long, has many series left in it, but maybe one or two, you know, but I didn't think, something told me that I just didn't think it was the end of Red Dwarf as a television show at the time, you know? When you look back at certain bits, you go, oh, that was good, we pulled that off. And that's kind of technical stuff that was challenging then. Mm. Wouldn't be so difficult now, but it was then. I've always said that one of the main reasons that, that, that kept me in that rubber head was the writing. The, the, you know, that, the writing of those series is exquisite. I mean, uh, you know, and it, and it stood the test of time. I think I, always, I really admired it at the time, but wasn't sure exactly what it was. I didn't, you know, it's very hard to, well, as you're working on it, to see really what it is, the quality of that. But it was. Uh, hard to learn and other actors that are proper actors that have been in the show have said this is really hard to learn because they, they don't use any cliches and any actor as you learn lines there'll be you know even things like dry as a bone or you know stitch in time so like, you know what are all those things little tiny ho uh, language hooks help you learn something there are none in Red Dwarf there are no there's nothing to grip onto it's a very shiny polished 
orb of joy. We were always progressing forward all the time. You kind of thought, when you finish that particular series, you go, no, this is okay, this, this is, surely this has got to keep going, you know. <clears throat> Different time then, too, the BBC were, were, were more, what's the word, rich. <laughs>